Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Let's start with the problem. In the last uh, 17 years, I'm working in how to transform the classroom experience. And my first motivation was this one. Basically, the classroom hasn't changed for over 500 years. The classroom is one where the teacher is an active element and the students are completely passive. And the consequences of this, we measured this last year, and we got this data, which is really amazing. This was measured in five schools with 172 kids at the end of third year. And what you have here is the National Curriculum of Chile of the first, second, third, and fourth year. That means that the Chilean government indicates the schools that they have to teach these contents ordered in this way through the four years. This is basic math arithmetics. These kids were uh, assessed at the end of third year, and what you see in the vertical axis is the number of children that achieved that contents. That means that 20, 20 kids really knows the contents of the second trimester of first grade. They don't know anything from here on, only they know this at the end of third year. So what you have here, if you make some conclusions, is that six, around 60 kids should be sitting in first grade and not at the end of third grade. And around 100 kids should be sitting at second grade and not at the end of third grade. What happens here is basically that these kids are progressing in the school, but they're really not learning anything. And this is real data. Only six kids really follow what the teacher is teaching. And this is terrible, because all these kids at the end of school won't know anything. And also what these kids are, they're very annoyed, because they go today to school and they know they won't learn anything and they won't understand anything. So one solution was, give these kids computers. Computers will be miracles, and you will change everything. So a lot of countries, especially Peru and Uruguay, bought computers, and now in Argentina they bought a couple of millions of computers, believing what Negro Ponte said, give them a computer and something miracle will happen. However, today we know there is no miracle. The Economist, a month ago, on April 7th, said, error message, a disappointing return from investing in computing. And this was based on a report of the Inter-American Development Bank on the work done in Peru of over 350,000 kids that showed that it was even worse giving computers than not giving computers. So what I say is, what can we do? I think in 2006, in a conference like this, I met Kentaro Toyama of Microsoft Research India. And that made a change for me. So I'm really grateful to Microsoft to have met Kentaro and to be in conferences like this. And going to Kentaro, he invited me to Bangalore once. And what we did is to work with the uh, with a driver they developed that allowed to put more than one mouse to a machine. What Microsoft Bangalore wanted to do is to have a lot of kids working on one machine so to diminish the cost of technology. So we started first one machine, three kids. That was our first step in 2007. And what we did there is the stuff we were doing from 2001, where we were working in collaborative environments where each kid had one machine. At that time, we were working with pocket PCs. So the type of stuff that we were doing is basically for small kids from kindergarten up to second and third grade in basic math and basic language. What we saw, base, what we saw is that interaction was great. The kids interacted among them and with the virtual world. And the type of activities that we were doing were the type that you will see here, where you have, for example, a common output. Each kid owns a space, 
and each kid is marked by a pointer of a given color, and that pointer can only choose the objects in the same color space. And what they have to do is to sort these elements. So basically, they are collaborating through the interactions in this virtual space, and communication and coordination is key in this type of work. What we obtained basically is really a very important improvement in learning. And with the support of Partners in Learning, we have today over 10 schools in Guatemala. And in Chile, we also have around that number a little more of schools that are working with type of technology. What we saw is afterwards the value of games. Also with the support of Microsoft Research, we were engaged in the Games for Learning Institute where we began working with games. And one of the things we looked for was first-person shooting, Doom. Why don't we bring Doom to school? You say, you're crazy. Yeah, we don't have to kill people, but the, the concept behind is very attractive, especially for boys. So what we did is, instead of killing persons, we began capturing numbers, capturing objects. And here you have the three students that have to order these numbers over here, and these numbers are in these cubes that they have to find in the maze, and, and in a given sequence, try to capture them, so to sort these numbers accordingly. We just finished this game, and the first study is that the involvement and the engagement of the kids is really incredible. We also use this type of technology for science teaching, also with games. This is also part of the Games for Learning Institute, what we did there. Coulomb. What's more difficult to learn than Coulomb? And what we did with high school kids, we teach Coulomb through games. And the game that we did here was the following one. You have always with collaboration, for, because for me, collaboration is key. When you, try, when you can do collaboration, do it. So you have these three kids over here, and each kid can select their charge, which is positive or negative, and the magnitude of the charge. And what they have to do is to move this object, which is also charged with their astronauts, and bring this object to a given portal, so to really achieve the rain. The problem is that there are, there's, are these elements here, these asteroids that are moving, and they have to take care that their object don't collide with the asteroid and really reach the portal. What we really saw was amazing. First, they really learned a lot. Here I have to make a click, I'm sorry. Not only they learned, but the engagement was incredible. A, a couple of kids, I think, three boys and one girl asked us if this was available in the web so they could download it. They really wanted to continue working on electric charges. And the secret here basically is that when the rules of the game collide with the rules of the pedagogy, then the game is really extremely attractive. And here what's interesting is that we're always using a very cheap technology, just one machine for three kids. We are now also working now in a collaborative language lab where the idea is that we not only have mouse, but now we have an earphone and a microphone. And the idea is that the kids learn to spell and understand foreign language also collaboratively. The idea here is that, for example, they have to sort these words to build a phrase over here, but now there's no mouse. What they have is a microphone. So what they have to do, they have to talk. They click, I want to talk. So this guy, for example, says, they. And if the system understands the word, he accepts the words. However, if the, spiel, the speech recognition system don't understand the word, what will happen is that the system will say, did you mean are? So we, there's a threshold which guesses for the word, and if the word is not spelled accordingly, what happens is that the system will tell the person, please spell it as it is, and he gets also feedback from the earphones. What we saw here is that comparing with a system which was not collaborative and another system which was a control without technology, what we saw is that the pronunciation got a significant impact with the non-collaborative one. 
and the control group uh, was less and not uh, significant in listening and pronunciation. So the value of collaborative technology was especially important in pronunciation, which is very difficult to achieve in a, la in a classroom with a lot of students. Then we move to 1 to 10. In 1 to 10, things get a little more complicated. It's not just plugging three mice to one machine. Here you have now one computer, one projector, and also you have now a lot of cables. You have a hub and the cables that connect this mouse. And this hub now connects to another hub until you reach the number of students you want. What we did here basically was, I would say, a technology enhanced learning environments. Here we're talking more of an environment where the kids are interacting within them and interacting with the virtual world. What's interesting here, that the kids really interacted among them and really collaborated in a very difficult problem. What we did here was the food chain, and there was a, diff a, a, a sequence of objectives, a, a, a sequence of goals that they had to achieve, and we really uh, obtained a very interesting engagement of the kids. The idea behind was to follow the MMOG type of games, but instead of having a massive multiplayer online game, what we had is a classroom multiplayer presential game, because it was a face-to-face -face experience. But we really achieved an incredible engagement of the kids. Uh, we published a paper where we followed a series of guidelines of how to develop these face-to-face -face collaborative games. This is really not easy to achieve, because what you have compared with regular games is that the kids are now collaborating, a lot of kids collaborating, and they're also face-to-face -face and not uh, at distance as are in the games which are in the web. If somebody wants the paper, just let me know, I will send it to you. In any case, this is uploaded and you can have it. And then we move to the limit. A whole classroom full of mouse. What you have here is a photograph in Chile. This is in Costa Rica. This was a Laxir project where we worked in Chile, Brazil, and Costa Rica last year. We just finished this project. This is in Costa Rica. This is in Brazil, and this is in India. We did this with also with Kentaro Toyama a couple of years ago when we just started with the one mouse per child. We named this one mouse per child. It's not one laptop per child, it's one mouse per child. And it cannot, it cannot get cheaper, because the cost of a system like this is, less, is around $1 per child per year. So cheaper than this, you cannot really get. The type of things we did here are the following ones. Each kid owns a small piece of the screen, you see it here, and the mouse cannot move out of this space, for example, here. Each child is ident identified by an icon, and the children get an intelligent tutoring system where they can work at their own speed. And the system has persistence in, this, in the way that between uh, lectures, the system remembers the state of the kid, so the kid advances at their own pace. The type of feedback that the kids get is the following one. This kid did it right, this kid did it wrong, this kid is sleeping, that means this kid has done anything in the last minute, this kid is in deep sleep, that means that this kid hasn't done anything in the last three minutes. And this is important feedback information for the teacher, so the teachers know who he should address. On the other side, since this is an intelligent tutoring system, the kids receive different type of rules. For example, the simplest rules is this one, then it gets a little more complicated, like this one, and then more and more complicated. And here you see how the different kids are advancing. Here you have the number of the rules where the kids are. In green, they, the exercises they did right. Yellow, they did one mistake, and red, they did two or more mistakes. 
and to finish one of these rules and go to the next rule, like for example this kid which just finished a rule, they have to have at least eight correct answers from which the last five have to be in a sequence of correct exercises so that we know they are really not guessing. We compared this uh, one mouse per child system with a one-to-one -one system. What we did, we used this intelligent tutoring system, which is just this rule-based system, exactly with the same interface, and ported to a netbook. And we worked in 15 weeks in one school with three groups. A group with, which had the one mouse per child, a group which had the netbook using the same uh, intelligent tutoring system, and a group with paper and pencil. And what we observed was really very interesting. The paper is the green, the red one is the interpersonal computer or the one mouse per child, and the blue one are the netbooks. And what you see here is the number of students, the level that the, the percentage of students, the level they achieved after 15 weeks of work. Interesting is that the kids with paper and pencil advance much, much faster than the technological ones. And both technological ones are around the same. The, the, the kids in the one mouse per child were a little faster, but there's no significant difference. However, we were really afraid when we saw this and say, hey, look to the kids in paper and pencil. They're working much faster than the other ones. Each of the groups always had a teacher that was helping and supporting the different kids. However, when we finished the post-test, what we saw was that the improvement in learning of the interpersonal computer, that's the one mouse per child, was around the same as the netbook. However, paper and pencil was much less. And the reason is that in paper and pencil, once they finished a sequence of exercises, they had to go to the answer sheet, look which exercises they had wrong, and make them again. And if the teacher really didn't go into detail with the kids, the kids didn't learn from their mistakes. However, in the technological ones, the kids couldn't advance if they really didn't overcome the problems. And that made a huge difference. So here we saw, and we are uh, we submitted this paper, which is now in the second review. Uh, and the importance here is really to show that not only technological systems are much more efficient than paper and pencil, though we already knew, but that the one, small, one mouse per child had a similar efficiency as a one-to-one -one technology. Now, the project we had now with Laxir, which I mentioned before, was to introduce games into the one mouse per child. And what we did here used very simple games because the space we have is really small. You will see it in a couple of seconds. And we used very simple games like, for example, building a bridge, capturing chickens, capturing fish, which is very similar to the other one. And how you say el dardo? Eh, tirar al dardo, how you say it in English? Huh? Darts, exactly, darts. Eh, it looks like this when you have a lot of kids working simultaneously. The engagement, what we measured, we just finished the paper, we're just really finishing now the paper because we had a huge delay because as you might remember last year there was strike in Chile and it wasn't easy to make a, an experiment with schools which are on strike and not on strike, so we had to delay the Chilean schools to the beginning of this year and we just finished, so we are now finishing the paper. So what we saw basically is the following one. If you remember, and I'm going back, that's an important learning, is that here the kids are constructing their answers. Here the kids cannot guess, they have to construct the answers. But for simplicity, and of course after the words everybody's general, we just didn't construct the answers here, but the kids choose the answer. So the guessing factor was much higher than on the other one. And our principal learning experience here is that, and we are now developing the, the, the new uh, type of games exactly with what 
as we did uh, in with the other non-gaming games, on constructing the answer and not guessing the answer. We didn't saw any difference in learning between the games, uh, the, the one most per child with games and without games. And for us, the difference is that basically here the guessing factor was really important. So what we're doing now is the new generation where the kids have to construct the answer and not selecting the answer. That's the main uh, lesson that we obtained from that experience. The engagement was much, much higher. And the other thing is that we also saw that in rural areas where kids have no connection with technology or very little connection with technology, the engagement was much higher than in urban areas. And the last thing we have done is the collaborative 1 to 49. Since, as you remember, for me, collaboration is key, the question is how can kids collaborate when they are in an environment like this? And what you have here is four groups or up to, ten, up to ten kids where each kid owns a point. The aim here is to construct a triangle. And since, since each child owns a point, what they get initially is a uh, polygon. And the teacher tells them this is a polygon, but this is not a triangle. What you have to do is to build from this polygon a triangle. So the kids, and they're not sitting one beside the other, the kids, the composition of the groups is completely random, so they really cannot speak to each other, even they begin to shout and the teacher tries to, shut, to, to, to stop them. So they have to find how to really collide these points into different vertices, up to three vertices, to build this triangle. And they get immediate feedback from the system, from a face which is not smiley, to a face that increasingly more smiley, until the end, which the face is happy, and they'll tell them that's okay. What we saw here, that the kids learn, they have to really uh, have some time to understand how this works, but the kids learn how to build these triangles, and the, the important thing is that they're learning by doing. And there's immediate feedback of the system, and the teacher is, of course, a key element that supports, the, through mediation, the work inside the classroom. Let me finish, and I did it in 20 minutes. Uh, let me finish with an epilogue. For me, we are in a very important moment. I was 25 years ago in my first international conference in Melbourne in, the pro, in a prologue conference. It was a prog uh, in the logic programming conference. And Herbe Galer, I remember if it were today, told the conference people, don't let's miss the boat. And we're exactly in the same moment. I think that Neuroponte was very important to bring up that technology can make a point. But results like this, what they're doing is showing that if we don't integrate digital and non-digital resources accordingly, politicians won't believe us anymore. We have to be very careful because examples like this are abundant. We're happening now in Argentina, for example, they, the kids won't learn if there's really a clear pedagogy behind. We are now working with the Plan Ceibal in Uruguay, we're working also in Colombia, where the governments really understand that there has to be a clear pedagogy. But what's really missing, the, the important issue here, is that up to now, there's only one big project that has shown significant results at a, at a uh, size of 100 schools and that being SRI of Menlo Park in a project in, if I'm not wrong, in Texas, with around 130 schools, they showed that for fraction in third and fourth grade, if I'm not wrong, they really showed significant results. But there are no other examples in the world that have shown that technology can make a difference. I have moved up to 10 schools, but going up to 100 schools, it's really difficult because you have to be engaged with the government and there things get much more difficult. I would say that's really the next step, to show that technology can make a change and show people like this that if you do it right, technology can really change what I showed at the beginning, kids that don't learn anything. Thank you very much. Okay, we have time to take some questions.
five minutes. Si me permite, te voy a hacer la pregunta en español. Eh, ¿Qué posibilidad hay o qué experiencias han hecho de aplicar este tipo de soluciones en ámbitos de educación superior? I will answer in English. The question was uh, if we have experience in at university level. We have worked from kindergarten up to university students. We have worked in computer science, in chemistry, and uh, in other engineering uh, 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 courses. And here the key point is that it's not free to really change the way you teach. The engagement of the teachers is very difficult. The students like it because the students get engaged in what they're doing. However, preparing material for the teacher is a very uh, hard labor work. And the universities where we have worked, even in my own university, my own school, didn't give the teachers any support. So it was just the will of the teachers to make these new contents. And at the end, there are so many other obligations that the teachers didn't use it. So if there's really no support behind the change of the way you teach, nothing will happen. That's the key element. Because the technology is there. At the university level, you, the, the problem is the developing of contents. In the case of the schools, we do the contents because it's a standard curriculum. But at the university level, we cannot do the contents. The teacher has to do the contents. Thank you. I am curious about the assessment that um, a person learns by doing, and then there's uh, maybe classic exams where people, you know, you have the problem and then you have to answer. Um, how is this gap uh, shortened with uh, your approach? That's a very good answer. What we have done up to now is always a pre and post it on paper. But what we saw, especially now with the games project, that the kids that were working with games through around four weeks, and then we did the post it on paper, they didn't uh, perform as good as the, as the data we saw on the computer. And the, the point here is, how do they transfer the knowledge they did electronically to paper? That's really an important issue that we now observe and now we have to deal with. But that's a very important issue. How do you transfer from one media to the other? Yes. But I would say before, we haven't saw that. We just saw this when we began working with games as the one we showed. Uh, yes, I am curious about uh, the engagement of girls in, in, in games because uh, most of the, the boys are really engaged on that, but what about girls? Have you checked about it? Yes. We have worked with different technology, and I would say the one that was, that was most out of the sequence was with augmented reality games when we were working with the Games for Learning Institute. There we saw a real clear difference with boys, between boys and girls. The girls didn't like the augmented reality games because they didn't understand them. Because what in the augmented reality, they got a netbook with a camera, so they looked to the screen, and what they were looking was the real world plus the virtual world that was added. And they really had problems in engaging in, this pro in these games. They didn't like it. I would say in these games, the data we have makes, shows no difference between boys and girls. Even in this first-person shooting, the games liked it very much because they were not killing anybody. There was no killing, there was no blood. It's just a, the same type of dynamics, but they, there was no difference. The only, the, only way, the only type of games where we saw a difference was in these augmented reality games. There, the girls definitely didn't like it. They express didn't like this type of games. One last question. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So this is another example that uh, shows that women are not considered with technology. We don't wear pants, and I have to... <laughs>
to have these things here. Uh, thank you very much. I am going to change focus from users to a kind of plumbing exercise uh, concerning information management. Uh, but this is not yet another information uh, management presentation because in this work we try to consider the user in the process of integrating information and particularly what we are willing to do is to try to provide integration tools that can be used very easily by users without having to uh, deal with uh, engineers in order to build their solutions. Uh, well, this is the ultimate objective of, of our work, and uh, today I'm going to uh, show some results concerning the uh, integration and the querying of information, which is largely distributed. And in order, I don't know how to use this, uh, yes, in order to uh, do that, I'm going to introduce the concept of mashups. And, um, for doing this, uh, let's consider the following scenario. Uh, consider that we are going to build a system in order to provision groceries around the world. And these groceries are provided by different users. For instance, in Europe, they are uh, willing to provide directly from the producers in bio farms. Uh, that people can go to and uh, ask for their products. In other countries, they are uh, provided by grocery stores. And in other countries, like in Mexico, we have this global market in, the, uh, in Mexico City that wants to make decisions on the way uh, the uh, groceries should be um, uh, sent to different countries in order to um, provide users with their groceries. And uh, imagine that in this context, in order to access to all this information, uh, these uh, providers are grabbed as services. And uh, service uh, understood as an application that provides an API uh, on a network. And uh, uh, using these uh, interfaces, the people willing to access to information about these groceries can uh, express queries. For instance, this uh, lady would like to have continuous information about the location of the providers of, gra of fresh groceries with a description of the daily production that are located no farther than eight kilometers of her current position. She likes to move a lot and that are open in the afternoon. But uh, this query is quite a complex one. It deals with spatial temporal aspects, with continuous data. But as I said, we don't want a programmer, a real programmer, to do that. Rather, we would like her to be able to use a tablet and then define uh, in a very easy way this integration uh, aspect. Uh, another user would like to have uh, bigger uh, intervals of information access. For instance, he wants to access information weekly, but here the important thing is that he wants to be sure that the groceries that come to his uh, home are uh, produced by responsible economy. And again, he will use a computer in order to mash up this information and be aware of uh, this uh, information uh, weekly. And then we have the producers that have to make very important decisions in order to be sure that the groceries will arrive on time to the, uh, to the consumers. And uh, they have to track the trucks in, uh, that are in the, in the area, and they have to be sure that the groceries do not rot according to the, uh, to the type of groceries they are selling, and also that the conditions of uh, refrigeration are well uh, assured in order that the groceries have uh, enough quality. Uh, and again, they want to uh, build their applications in an easy way. Uh, as I said uh, in the beginning, this is not only the, uh, the issue like uh, defining queries and mashups, but we have 
uh, to consider the difference uh, of, uh, of uh, quality of service associated to the way the information will be delivered. For instance, if I'm on my phone or if I'm going around the city, I would like to uh, um, uh, spare the battery that is uh, used in order to integrate this information, and I would also uh, like to avoid mega, a lot of mega octets uh, running uh, to my uh, to my phone because then the cost, the economic cost of the query will be very high. Uh, so there's uh, the uh, requirements of the user do not also only concern the type of information in order to be matched up, but also the cost of the query that will uh, help integrate this information. Uh, there are two ways of doing this. There's the classic way where uh, that we are all used to, to use, and uh, this implies that we have specific servers and amount of computing uh, resources in order to build this application. This is uh, clearly a global integration application where we have to access different databases in order to integrate the information, and this information can be stored in different uh, persistent supports and access uh, on servers. And here if we adopt this uh, classic way of doing this, uh, the objective is to efficiently manage and exploit the data sets according to given specific storage, memory, and computing resources. But as you see, in this large distributed environment, it is, it is very difficult to have control on the type of computing resources that we have access to. And therefore, there's another new way of seeing things that was introduced by this architecture named the cloud that uh, provides us with the possibility of sharing uh, servers, storage support, and also uh, applications. And there, the objective of integrating and providing results to integration is to uh, provide costly manage and exploit data sets according to unlimited storage, memory, and computation resources. And the only limit that we will have to consider is the cost of access to these resources in, the, in different moments. Uh, in the project that uh, we uh, run, we adopt this uh, vision and we try to see how to solve the problem of integration according to uh, this context. And uh, the challenges are stated as follows. We would like to uh, see that everything, even the devices and the information providers, are seen as services that have to be combined and coordinated in order to evaluate the queries. And since we uh, would like to see the process of retrieving the information, we would like to combine these services and have partial results of the, uh, of, of the queries and present them in a, a friendly manner. Uh, since we are dealing with quality of service issues, then we would like to optimize the queries according to the restrictions that different users have and then propose test beds in order to, uh, to address the, uh, the solutions. And also another important hypothesis that we have is that we do not suppose that there is a DBMS of the shelf that can deal with these queries. And, uh, so the, um, there are different um, challenges to be addressed. Uh, in our context, we would like, of course, to provide very easy languages in order to specify the requirements that will deal with the services and with spatial temporal uh, elements in order to uh, be aware of the location of data and also, and very important, the way the data will be presented. Then, uh, well, we have uh, proposed languages in order to, to de uh, do deal with these expressions. Another important thing is quality of service. So we would like to uh, um, associate contracts of quality of service to the uh, expressions that deal with the integration of information. And then, 
Uh, normally, in, in my example, people know that which are the services uh, they want to use in order to integrate the, their data. But in a very distributed uh, context, it is rare to really know which are the services, and it is important to uh, know that there are other services that can probably be used in order to address our queries. So we are address a problem of services lookup, con uh, considering semantics and recommendations systems, and then comes the problem of doing this efficiently. But in, uh, instead of uh, meaning efficiently with respect to time response, we think that efficient means uh, having the pertinent information in the, se in the good moment and in the uh, good context, adapted to the context. Uh, so, uh, the objective is kind of do a little uh, plumbing in order to put services uh, new services on the cloud in order to help applications to be built in an easy manner. Um, uh, of course, there's a, a lot of things to, to be said. I'm going to uh, uh, focus on the efficiently, efficiency aspects, and I'm going to deal with query evaluations in this context. And I'm going to address three uh, points of view that uh, we deal with in, the, in our project. First is the notion of hybrid query. Second is how to optimize these queries in order to address the uh, quality of service requirements. And finally, how this can be deployed on a cloud uh, architecture in order to uh, build these uh, applications. First of all, the notion of hybrid query. Normally, when we uh, have dealt with SQL-like uh, expressions and, and languages, um, there are solutions dealing with continuous data, and there are other solutions dealing with spatiotemporal data, and other solutions dealing with uh, continuous queries. And none of them consider services as uh, first citizens. Uh, in, the, in their models. What we are doing is that we suppose that uh, we have the APS accessible uh, in some networks, and what we will do in order to answer the query is coordinate the calls in order to fetch the information, and then have other activities in order to aggregate this information and to process it in order to provide results. Um, so this is uh, uh, a coordination problem that should be addressed uh, dealing with spatiotemporal aspects with the fact that we will consume data on demand or continuously from static or mobile devices and that this should be evaluated continuously or in batch, depending on the requirements of the users. And then, but this is not all, because there's the uh, quality of service involved in this coordination. And the quality of service deals with all the infrastructure that will be used in order to evaluate these kind of queries. And this concerns the network, this concerns the number of megaoctets that are going around in order to produce results, and this concerns also the battery used in order to evaluate these processes. So there's a bunch of uh, infrastructure that needs to be observed in order to ensure that the quality of service will be, um, will be um, fulfilled. And so these elements, uh, these observation elements have to guide the way each of the coordinations are being done and the process of the data is being done. Um, in our project, we uh, had this, uh, this challenge, and we have uh, partial results that help us to answer this type of queries. First of all, well, we have, of course, the query, and in order, everybody knows that in order to address with information, and of course, of integrated information that is produced in different formats, it is important to have a, a data pivot model that helps us to uh, to integrate this information. We use a classic approach of that data modeling that is well known today in, on the web, and that is JSON. So the representation of data uh, being exchanged and produced by services is JSON, and behind the JSON model, in fact, that what we have is a data model that includes 
uh, simple data types and complex data types. And we inclu included in these data types the fact, the notion, uh, we use the notion of tuple, the notion of sets, in order to represent the fact that there are continuous data being produced. And we also defined a set of operators that help us to deal and process this data. Uh, for instance, if uh, this is the kind of, of, of structure that we use in order to represent it, uh, there are containers that, that have sensors in order to determine whether the groceries are being distributed with uh, the, con the conditions that they require, and we will have this type of description. But the data is not everything in our approach because the services are also important services interfaces are also important in order to deal with our queries. So we use the same model in order to represent the uh, services interfaces that are uh, participating in the evaluation of the query. Once we have this, then we have to deal with the query model. As I said, uh, the query will be a services coordination, so it's a workflow that should be represented uh, under a model. We used a well-known formalism uh, used in services coordination approaches, which is called uh, ASM, and we also used the uh, uh, associated language in order to deal with the uh, coordinations. So uh, the formalism is based on abstract state machines, and we use these abstract state machines in order to uh, implement the queries. What is, what is very interesting uh, is that services coordination solutions uh, used in Microsoft, for instance, use ACML, so the language, in order to have engines that can deal with this kind of uh, uh, workflow executions. And finally, there's the, on the top of the, of, of the solutions, we have languages that integrate not only the spatiotemporal and the uh, aspects and the continuous aspects of the data, but they also integrate the quality of service and the way the data will be presented on a screen. And depending on the type of screen that they will, uh, it will be used in order to show the data, the presentation will be adapted uh, to them. And, of course, we have a prototype the, the, uh, that uh, is called Ipatia, and this prototype is able to evaluate uh, these kind of workflows. Uh, so if we go down uh, in deeper in the solution, once you have the hybrid query, it is implemented as a query workflow, and the query workflow must be generated. So we provide algorithms in order to go from a, a high-level description of the integration to a lower level, uh, which co uh, concerns the problem that the program that will uh, be evaluated in order to solve the query. So to give you an idea of how it is presented, uh, we have a classic uh, workflow composed of activities. Some of the activities will be directly connected to the services that provide the information, and other activities will implement and coordinate uh, other kind of services that will help us to uh, to deal with the data, to process the data. For instance, in my query, I wanted to know which are the providers that are three kilometers from my current position. This is a classic operation of uh, KNN. Uh, this is a KNN operation that uh, we implemented, and what we did is we used uh, services on the cloud in order to implement small coordinations that we could control in order to uh, process this data. And we did the same with different filters and other classic operators that were adapted to the context. Uh, once you have the program that implements your query, you are not sure that this is the best way to do that. So there's the optimization challenge to be addressed. And uh, generally speaking, the, uh, this problem is stated as follows. In fact, what we want is to find the query workflows that implement the hybrid query and that best conveys to the uh, quality of service contract according to the available services. And this uh, has three main elements in order to be addressed. First, we have to figure out a cost function that uh, integrates the 
qual the quality of service uh, of the expression of the query with the real cost of the services and real uh, measures associated to the services that provide the data. And once we have that, then we can expect to produce a solution space that will help us to decide which is the best query at a given moment that should be executed in order to provide results. First of all, I will show the intuition of the associated with uh, from the service level agreement to the, so the quality of service expression to the hybrid query. And this goes as follows. In order to determine the cost of the query, we need to have observation measures of the services that provide the data and of the platform that is being used in order to solve the query. We uh, decided to choose five measures in order to start. We consider the throughput of the network. Uh, we consider the la latency in order to uh, have responses of the services and the latency considered in order to get the data. We also consider the fact that services are in general not all the time available, so we would like to know uh, the percentage of availability of the services. The execution time that, uh, uh, of one uh, service call and the price. The price is a quite a, a big challenge because services in general can export the price, but for instance, if you are using a network, it is very difficult to figure out uh, the price of a certain bunch of megaoctets with respect to the real uh, economic cost that you are going to, uh, to get by uh, transferring this data. And then on the other side, we have the expression of quality of service requirements. And we consider three aspects. We consider the battery, we consider the uh, time, the response time, and the economic uh, cost. And the objective was to uh, provide a cost function that will deal uh, with, this, uh, with this correlation of, uh, of measures. We have an, uh, uh, clearly a multidimensional optimization problem. And as everybody knows, this is a very difficult thing to solve. And initially what we did is we tried to uh, represent, under, well, combine the different preferences of the measures uh, expressed in the quality of service contract and have a one uh, threshold uh, value that will help us to uh, guide our optimization. And the intuition is that we are going to have uh, to ponderate the different measures that are implied in the uh, quality of service requirement contract against the services available to solve a query that can really be combined and have and respect this, uh, this value. And with this uh, threshold, then we are going to suppose that this value represents the maximum cost that I can accept uh, from a query in order to be executed. And that's the, the threshold, but now I have the problem of really building the workflows that will uh, respond to the query. And uh, intuitively, uh, the idea is that I can do everything one uh, in sequence, all the, all the operations in sequence, or I can try to parallelize some of the, uh, of the operations in order to avoid uh, time cost. The problem with that is that uh, I will have a lot of communication costs. So I really have to have the balance between parallelizing the activities or uh, making them in sequence so that I can respect the threshold that I computed in uh, using my function. So this is a rewriting problem that we address considering the structural constraints of any workflow. This means that I need to build workflows that terminate and that do not have deadlocks. And also considering the characteristics of the data processing operators that are implied in the workflows and the quality of service requirements. And using these three elements, I will decide, I will generate a solution space that uh, will be uh, organized as follows. I have my solution space, I have the threshold, and in fact what uh, gives my solution space is a set of possi possible queries that can be executed that respect the, uh, the expected quality of service. 
and in order to decide which of those are pertinent in order to uh, respond the query. What I built is a multidimensional space using uh, in each axe all the dimensions that I uh, express in my, in my quality of service contract. I will put the objective is the uh, black dot, which uh, is computed using the, the uh, cost function, and the other dots represent the possible queries that I can uh, that I can use in order to answer the query. And I will look for a region that uh, is composed of all the query workflows that are not uh, that are at a certain distance with respect to the objective. And then using a top K classic uh, algorithm used in uh, information research engines, I will get one of, I will uh, classify them and then decide which of them will be computed. Uh, then the deployment. Uh, as I said, there are a lot of, of uh, there's been a lot of research done in order to deploy these kind of solutions, either centralized or either using distributed or parallel architectures. The problem with them is that services are not quite exploited as for citizens uh, in this context, and that query evaluations really uh, are not services compositions. They are translated to programs and then evaluated. What we did is uh, we uh, built a, ser a full service oriented evalua query evaluation that was then integrated in a platform that could uh, serve as query engine. And uh, it looks like this. We have a set of services deployed in a cloud uh, infrastructure. Some of the services used for uh, dealing with computations are uh, done on Amazon uh, Cloud, and the other uh, services are, uh, are deployed in Azure. Then we have the query engine, that, which is called the Patio, that really uh, Computes the, uh, computes the services, and then at the top of the, of the stack, we have the application level with web browsers that can be used in order to mash up the information. So, and then we, uh, for the mobile uh, querying, we used uh, Link in order to express some of the queries that deal with uh, the Azure services uh, that were deployed. Then we have Ipatia, which is the real uh, execution query, and we also used a, a level in order to build applications using a methodology that exists in order to build mashups. Uh, this is one of the aspects of our project, but there were a lot of aspects uh, involved. There's the problem of uh, looking up for services that was addressed uh, mainly by Regina Motz, who's a specialist in uh, service, semantic service description and that has also service recommendation systems in order to look for services. There are the quality of, of, of service uh, concerning uh, non-functional aspects and the expression of them that were addressed by Martin Musicante and Alberto Pardo. And uh, uh, spatial temporal query language is another uh, the data management issues on the cloud addressed by Jose Luis Equinelli. Um, in, in order to sum up the, the results and impact of our, of our work is, of course, that we consolidate and enhance research information integration through data services coordination. We deal with very interesting aspects in a novel manner, as uh, some of the papers that we have published have shown. But one of the important things is that these kind of solutions were addressed uh, in order, to, were used in order to address some e-government problems and other uh, methodological problems that are uh, done in other projects uh, with a Latin American group. And I think that this is the most important thing that we managed to put together our experiences and expertise in order to address this interesting problem. Thank you very much, and I'm ready to get questions.